Now, if I press this button, that should mean that we are actually um, that we are actually live, just about on time for this week's Rail Matter. Uh, hopefully, the audio is coming through. Our, our visitors, our guests, our listeners, um, our viewers can let me know that the audio is coming through. Um, and and uh, Ian, uh, you have wine. I have beer. Wait, I tell you what. Let me press this button here, and we can. So I'm drinking. Um, I'm drinking. This is this is just from Sainsbury's actually. Uh, it looks quite nice. Hiver Fresh Natural Session IPA looks quite pleasant. Uh, I, I have a rather I have a rather nice Greek red actually. Oh, lovely! Well, that sounds very nice. Um, <laughs> cheers! Cheers! <laughs> yeah, cheers! cheers. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Rail Matter. We are um, uh, we are well actually we we are both very warm because Britain is currently very warm. Uh, as we're about to talk about in the news momentarily. Oh, without further... Right. Because it's very warm, we're gonna, I'm going to do my very best to keep us reasonably well scheduled. <laughs> so, oh, I'm going to press this button here. Uh, and Ian and I shall uh, have a sip while I talk about... Um, in fact, I'm going to stretch this, this machine over here because it allows me to do this sort of thing, which is talk about the latest coronavirus statistics. Uh, which everyone should be able to see. So, uh, to be honest, not much to report. We've got, for the last month or so, we've had stasis. We've had cycling and road transport are basically um, pretty much at 100% of pre-coronavirus levels. So, all things normal on the roads, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, bus services are stabilised around about 60%. So, 60% uh, for bus services, which is quite interesting. I, I, I'm surprised they've not risen higher than that actually so that's surprising me um and and then rail is pretty much bouncing around it's bouncing around here at around about the 50 percent mark so those are the numbers uh as they continue to be so we've had theoretically we've had the lifting of all of the of, of mostly of, of of the lockdown things but we didn't have this big bang of everyone being told workers have to go back to the the office so i think we might see a start seeing a steady climb after summer but i'm not sure who knows um we're getting dangerously close to this 75% trend line. Because if we drop below that, that, that really does become a problem. But uh, I, I'm expecting to see us rising. I, I would con expect to see it start rising steadily again towards the end of the year. Um, this heat might have reminded some people that having living, working in an office with air conditioning is actually nice. Uh, it's certainly been helpful for me. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, anyway... Uh, yeah, uh, Ian, how is it incredibly like? How is how hot is your um your room you're currently in? Is it? Are you also um, suffering from the heat? It's not too bad up here actually because we're we're relatively near the coast, so uh, that ah. sort of keeps things a bit keeps things a bit cooler. Um, can I just ask something about the the the, the, the figures there? I mean, oh, yeah, certainly. I've travelled on the train a couple of times, sort of on East Coast. And my impression is that East Coast services are pretty much back to what they were before. Mm. So I'm wondering if there's significant variation between different that's, services, different operators, particularly, I suppose, London. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And I think so. So my 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 insider knowledge is that all of the long distance operators are operating as close to their maximum capacity as, as they were used to already. The, the, this is the, I suppose, the challenge. I had a graph of it on the, on the coronavirus episode. This is the challenge of the reliance so much on um, southeastern commuters. Is that I'd, I'd say a decent chunk of this um, is from uh, southeastern commuters, um, plus other commuters elsewhere in the in the UK. But I think you're right. I think it's, it, there is quite a lot of variation. But I have people reporting back from you know Thameslink services saying Thameslink services are pretty full. I, I've caught some Thameslink services from Denmark Hill northwards recently. Um, and it was really busy. Uh, you know, it was sort of one of those, it was the sardines that I'm used to experiencing again. So I think there is a mixed, I think there certainly is a mixed uh, a mixed bag in terms of the different operators. I would say long distance services are already kind of way up there in terms of uh, seated capacity. People traveling around a lot more um, potentially uh, with traveling, you know, holidaying locally or holidaying within the country. Um yeah. So yeah, good good point. Uh, it'd be I, I've asked actually for the statistics to be provided as with a breakdown by train operating company, but I've not had a. I didn't actually get a response to that. That would have been really. If anyone from the ORR is listening, could you, uh, folks, can you uh, break it down by train operating company per day? Because that'd be incredibly powerful. Um, anyway, right. The news. We're going to start with uh, me being upset by TFL and Crossrail for continuing to repeat. 
things that are simply not true and are in fact excuses. The reason I harp on about level boarding all the time is because I, okay, I fairly frequently see things like this. So in their announcement of, of step-free access, you know, step-free access to platforms, step-free access to platforms is useless if you're then stuck on a platform and can't get on the trains, which is what happens on this uh, at West Drayton Station. Because level boarding has not been provided because the, 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 the West Drayton Station has different trains running on it, which means that the platform is set to the correct offset. But TFL spin this as due to the different types of trains running, including freight trains, level boarding could not be provided. This is not true. The reason level boarding could not be provided, as everyone watching this knows, is because they selected trains that do not have the uh, a low floor. So the train height is above the so the the train footstep is uh, about 200 mil above the standard platform position, uh, which is do lally anyway that's that's one thing so uh, they're lying again and it's very frustrating i wish they wouldn't i wish they'd admit that they made a bad call when they were specking this which is not entirely their fault because government told them that they had that they had to procure trains from bombardier and bombardier didn't have a train design that didn't have a that had a low floor so they were kind of stuck on that front but i wish they'd be honest about it what else is going on well i i, I think we've all noticed as we're living it right now that global warming uh, is at it again. Uh, we've had lots of extreme weather events, and uh, and before anyone goes, ah, but this is weather, not climate. Well, climate is the aggregation of multiple weather events over a period of time. In fact, the WMO definition is over 30 years, and over the last 30 years, the frequency of these events has increased. And uh, I thought this is a particularly stark image here of, a, of what looks like quite a nice little uh, regional train uh, working its way through a puddle. But the, I think you've seen there are a lot more horrific images than these out there from, from Germany, from Belgium, from Austria. And most recently, the most frightening images I've seen are from China. Uh, some really horrible images of the massive amount of flooding going on in, in, in a couple of major Chinese cities at the moment. Um, I'm not going to talk I, I, I'm not going to talk about exactly what some of that footage says because it's actually really not very nice. But uh, yeah, I think not good. Uh, meanwhile... As we can see from this uh, nice graphic from the IPPR that they put out last week, or maybe uh, it was two weeks ago, I can't quite remember, you can see that we need that green, those green lines are the amount of additional investment above the current proposals that are needed um, to reach net zero. Um, so you can see that that is quite a lot more. You know, we need to be spending an additional 12 billion a year on transport in the UK to actually reach the, the government's promised net zero targets. More investment needed. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, the government has decided to uh, continue to delay the integrated rail plan. Uh, and as a result of that, they've paused the best bit of HS2, the most important part, which is the section from Birmingham up towards Leeds, the eastern leg, as it's often called. Uh, this is not good either. Anyway, that's the news. I'm not going to dwell on this. I've, I've vented my frustrations on Twitter enough, but I thought I'd keep you all in the loop. So let's talk about, I, mean, I love this picture. This is a picture from one of the slides that, um, that Ian has provided. Um, I love this picture, it's brilliant. And we are, go and it is, it's great because uh, it summarizes quite neatly some of the things we're going to talk about in uh, tonight's episode. Tonight's episode is going to be all about where rail freight went, and Ian is going to guide us on that journey. So uh, essentially, uh, while Ian enjoys another sip or two of wine, while I yeah, top up my beer, <laughs> Ian is still here. Um, without further ado, Welcome to tonight's Rail Matter! City 225 fades away. We potentially were hearing a, a real East Coast train in the background there of, uh, uh, for Ian, which is quite nice. And um, Ian, we shall bring bring you back in the corner. Um, we're up in the top corner. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was that? I don't know what that was. That an Azuma whizzing past outside, or was it something a bit more metro-y? Um, I th that was a bit in Azuma, I think. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. Um, where where where, are, where where is outside? Where are where are you based, Ian? I'm, uh, well, for those who know Newcastle, I'm in Benton. I'm sort of just um, ah. a little, a little, in, um, where the metro crosses the East Coast main line, um, there used to be a spur, uh, the Benton North Curve that linked the two, hmm. and I back onto that. Oh, ah, lovely. Yeah. Well, that's, that is a house choice made by a, um, a railway 
someone who is a keen railway person. I, I hesitate to yeah. say railway enthusiast. <laughs> well, it was a joint choice with my partner at the time. We, it was for the garden, not for the railway. Oh, I see. Well, that's that's uh, a sensible choice. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. we start with this graph, which we're going to revisit later, um, which I think summarizes the kind of the bigger picture of what we're talking about, really, doesn't it? We've got uh, this red line here. So, so people are probably more, quite familiar with the, the bathtub curve that the that represents. It's not my favorite trend, actually, because I think it's a bit misleading. But it represents passenger journeys, the blue one here. And you can see it, it bottoms out in the in the 70s and starts climbing in the 80s. And then obviously climb, starts climbing very steeply through the 90s. People are and, and then does this, by the way, uh, recently. But we'll come back. That, that's for another. That's another story. So that's that. People are familiar with that trend. People are probably less familiar with the freight trend because I don't see it very often. And in fact, I was trying to get hold of the actual data so I could do a really nice white and orange one of my style graphics, and I couldn't find it. Um, it's quite difficult to get hold of the data. But this is um, million tons of freight loaded uh, per annum, and you can see that there is. It's just. It's just. It's just a dramatic downwards trend, really, isn't it? It's quite stark. Yeah, yeah. I think what's interesting is actually looking at that. I mean, as you say, the data is quite difficult to get hold of. Mm. Um, but it, the, the decline starts earlier, I think, than most people probably would have predicted. Um, you can see there it sort of starts to tail off in, well, I suppose at the end of the 20s, you've got the depression and a huge um, sort of drop in the coal traffic. But even, even taking that sort of out of the equation by the, you know, the beginning of the war, um, it's starting to to drop off, um, uh, and I think probably most people would probably have thought, well, no, it's going to be a bit later than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, yeah. And it's, yeah. it's something that um, actually, when when we had the beaching episode with Dr. David Turner himself co coming on and talking about it, it, he highlighted that people often associate this decline as being something in the fifties or sixties. Actually, the decline was happening earlier than that. It was happening even before the First World War, let alone in the interwar years. You know, the, the, those changes were happening very rapidly and, and we'll come to that but but yeah so it's really quite sharp beyond the once you get beyond the uh the second world war yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. so we basically and this is kind of one of the sub the kind of the subtext to all this is is a question that, I, that comes up which is was british rail to blame what were the railways was british rail to blame for this decline um yeah and and so you, you picked through this and explore this i think haven't you already it was it was, all, it was all down to the sandwiches i think <laughs> yeah, that's it yeah yeah i mean you know that's the usual story isn't it you know the sort of uh whenever people talk about you know the decline of uh of rail whether it's whatever aspect of it it is you know it's well british railways failed you know to modernize or they modernized incompetently you know like they did with the sort of diesel program or you know um and as perhaps we'll see uh, in this instance um to you know, spoiler alert, uh, I don't think they, do, they are to blame, um, you know, yeah. perhaps, as we'll see as we go through. Indeed, yeah, yeah, spoiler yeah. alert, but, but I mean, you all, it's a, everyone knows that, that situ, people know rail natted, they know what the deal was, they knew that this is a rhetorical question. Obviously, there are bigger yeah. things at play. So, let's have a look at those bigger things. Um, firstly, though, I like this slide, in the beginning, there was freight. And yes. we've got this wonderful, tell us about this picture. Well, this is a, um, a picture of the sort of early days of the Liverpool and, and Manchester Railway. Liverpool and Manchester, of course, you know, um, the first, if you like, sort of proper proper railway, um, fully steam haul, double track throughout, um, limited amount of cable haulage to start with, but not for long, um, but primarily built to convey freight um, between Liverpool and Manchester to... Uh, um, both not just speed things up, um, but also to avoid the uh, high charges imposed by the, um, was it the Duke of Bridgewater on the Bridgewater Canal, which was a huge oh. money-making venture for him. Um, so, you know, the, the railways were the railways were really built um, for freight. And, and and the early railway companies, I think, were rather taken aback, you know, by, by when they've discovered that people actually like to travel on them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, so the early sort of passenger services were, were very primitive really um just as a sort of to drop a bit of, of history in and um the metro that you can possibly also hear in the background there um the the line that's now incorporated in that from newcastle to north shields opened in 1837 i think was the first railway built specifically to carry passengers rather yeah, than freight. that's that's a good that's yeah, a very good yeah, fact yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, which is yeah. interesting given that there was such a high density of of freight railways 
you know, I, I often make the case that the railways didn't really start in the 1800s at all. They're actually in, in Britain. They started pretty much Bob on 1600. I think 1605 oh, really? is the first. Yeah. And there and, and the area that you currently live in was the center point for a huge number of those. Um, so it's interesting that it also had one of the first dedicated passenger lines built. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Liverpool Manchester worth worth mentioning was built with a large proportion of the freight intention being cotton. Mm. You know, it was a cotton hauling. It was a railway built for the cotton industry in the northwest, um, and all of the associated implications of why that might have been built and why Liverpool was the focal point for that and who might have been behind it. But um, I love this picture. It's I mean it's it, it looks familiar in the sense that you've got all these different loads and shapes. And yeah, everything still looks like it's on bicycle wheels and ever so spindly. It's uh, it's terrific. I particularly like the bottom one with all the animals. Yeah, I mean, so, here you have uh, quite literally have uh, cattle class. Uh, here, yeah. here we are, uh, lovely. Which is funny because uh, that those wagons are pretty much identical to the wagons that uh, third class passengers travelled in. <laughs> it looks like as if the pigs might be trying to escape. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, yeah. There's 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 it's it's chaos. But uh, yeah, that's a fantastic yeah. picture. I love that. And you can see this is this is Fury here, and uh, I can't quite tell which uh, this one is. But anyway, they look they look brilliant. Uh, it's a really lovely. Uh, it looks like Liverpool. Right? It does look like Liverpool, doesn't it? Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Uh, a train of wagons with goods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. And we'll come back. We'll come back to to, to this. You know, what what were the railways there for? Um, yeah. Later yeah. on. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Uh, so by by eight, by by 1954, the railways still there's, there's still this idea, right? That the that, that, that well, in fact, tell us what was the idea? What what, what where did the railways occupy in, in the in the minds of, of people in in the mid 50s? Well, it, it's interesting. I mean, the film that with the the clip that we're about to see is from uh, one of the British transport films uh, films called um, Fully Fitted Freight, and and just a little bit about British transport films, if I might. Mm, yeah, I mean, absolutely. they had sort of interesting roles i mean some of their stuff was purely instructional for staff some of it was promotional you know they were sort of advertising you know this is where the trains take you or can take you and buses of course because we we're in the days of british transport commission but the third set of films which are in some ways the most interesting were the ones that they were sort of trying to sort of inform people about you know what are the railways why are the railways here what do the railways do for us sort of thing and this is a good example the you don't get it in this clip but it's it's the, the narrator is talking to um, a, a, a putative Mrs. Smith, um, very patronizingly, but he's, he's explaining to Mrs. Smith, you know, this is how you get all your shopping, basically. Um, it's, it's carried to you on the railway. So this sort of clip just sort of, you know, highlights um, the, the range, really, that, the, uh, of goods that, that, that the railways were still carrying at the time. Yeah, so... Without further ado, I shall press on to the next slide, which I think will make the video autoplay. 15 cases Bristol milk sherry, 12 cases port, 6 bowls of cider, 10 cases of Spanish wine, 6 face pottery, 2 tons printed matter pottery, cartons of footwear, 10 tiers of leaf tobacco, 15 underweight cigarettes, 7 face machinery, 2 and a half tons light casting, 40 heavy duty dirt, 30 revolving office chair, 31 wicker chairs, 1 ton of bird seed, 8 plates of jam, 2 marmalade, 10 coffee essence, 2 wagons tomatoes, 58 step ladders, 4 big trucks, 2 ship wreck, 3 A rigs, 12 petrol motors, 9 dynamo. 72 room and one garden gate. That's lovely. Yeah, that really was a. <laughs> it's quite the, quite the serenade that one. Um, and it's interesting because uh, we talk about the th and this, and and actually, well, this is this is a sort of a sideshow to the to the main theme of the show. But actually, I think it's important. BTF is something that the railway industry has a you know communicating in the way that British transport films did is a massive vacuum for the rail industry now i think uh, and, and we have pockets of light in the form of you know for example you know the network rail southeast twitter feed is an example of almost emulating what british transport films did in in they explain in detail they have imagery of of, of the technical nature of what's actually going on and they level with people on that front in a way that british transport films did there's my, one of my favorite british transport films is the p-way one when they're, they're relaying a load of track with f-23 sleepers and welding it up and and they go and they show all the components all laid out it's brilliant we we have a, a lack of that nowadays, um, and but but it's interesting that 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 film there is emulating a, a bit of advertising that HS2 have done, where they talk about a freight train that they can free up, and they say, well, this freight train it has in it this 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 right, right, really right. interesting to to see uh, the comparison. Yeah, that 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 really is lovely. Is there anything else you want to say about that film? It's uh, it's glorious. 
Well, I mean, one of the other sort of underlying themes, which again doesn't really come out in that clip, was, you know, the railways don't just deliver your shopping. They actually unite the nation. Um, so, I mean, again, a bit of background. British Transport Films sort of looked back to the British documentary movement of the 1930s, the most famous production of which was Night Mail. Um, you know, in Night Mail, it's very explicit. You know, the train is uniting England and Scotland. It's, you know, serving everybody. It sort of doesn't discriminate. You know, the letters go to the rich and the poor and all of that. And this film does the same as well. So it talks about, um, in, it looks in more detail at delivering boots to someone in the Highlands, lorry tyres to Stockton budgie feed to, to Blackpool, chocolates to Manchester. And, and so there's this theme, you know, that the railways don't just have a, 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 if you like, a sort of, you know, function of delivering things. They have a much broader role, which is this, this one of really uniting the nation. Um, and that's quite a strong theme through the British transport films, particularly up until sort of about 1963, when it changes a bit, it becomes more commercially orientated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So well, that's interesting. I'm conscious we're getting we're getting a few questions through, and some of them I'm saving up for the end. But uh, John Christoph, uh, friend of the show, is saying um, that looks like a longer train than I'm used to seeing from contemporary UK freight rail train spotting. Have train lengths changed significantly as freight volumes have declined? Well, I mean, you might have an answer to this, but my, my answer is actually no. These are shorter than current trains, but the, I think the the train we just saw was one that looks like it had been fully marshaled. So it's not some of the local services yeah. that you often see with this... the, with bits and pieces. This is an express freight, hence the, the, the title fully fitted, um, express freight from Bristol to Derby. Um, so Bristol, obviously, lots of stuff being imported um, and then it's taken up to Derby where it's being redistributed around the country. So I suppose, I mean, and the other thing to point out, you know, is, is the, the thing which has changed massively, I imagine, is just the number of freight trains. I mean, you know, my childhood recollections of huge numbers of freight trains, you know, and, and that's not from the northeast. I didn't live in the northeast as a child, you know, when you had all the coal traffic up here. But just generally, mm, you know, yeah. there were lots and lots of, of freight trains. Uh, and, you know, there are, even on the East Coast Main Line, I think there are probably half a dozen a day now, if that, you know. I mean, yeah, numbers of, well, I mean, we have a fundamentally passenger railway, which make, yeah. I mean, they're also, we'll get through the, those reasons. But yeah, John Christoph, interesting observations. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think it says in one of the videos later, you could have had as much as six different trains that a wagon could be in before it went got from its uh, yeah, yeah. source to to destination um, yeah. and and the the end train there was often or perhaps the, the the penultimate train was often or certainly the middle longest bit was where it had been fully marshaled into its full length yeah. um, which is what what we're seeing here i think yeah, so yeah. i think if i click the next one we might have another video let me see what happens or it might i i, I ah right yes so the writing was on the wall ian why was the writing on the wall what was happening well, this, this is showing, um, it, it gives perhaps a slightly different picture to your earlier graph because it shows that um, in terms of, if you like, sort of the amount of freight being carried on the railways, it was pretty flat in this initial period of sort of nationalised railways, um, but that the market share was, was already declining. Um, uh, and actually, it's interesting, I came across a quote yesterday um, which suggested that uh, the point at which more traffic freight was carried on the road than rail actually came rather later than, than this graph suggests. But whatever, you know, I mean, whatever the, the sort of figures, you can see that, you know, there's a significant decline even in these six years in terms of the railway's market share. And this comes before the big impact uh, in the mid-1950s, which was the 1955 Aslef rail strike. Um, which yeah. had a pretty devastating effect on, on on rail freight. It was the point at which, yeah, I, I don't know whether we, we picked that up, but I, I don't think we specifically do, but it's the point at which there was a, you know lots of customers who had been holding out for rail and thinking, well, I'll kind of, I'm sure it'll yeah. stabilise after the war. I'll give them a bit of benefit of the doubt. Just went, you know what, stuff it. <laughs> yeah. I can just go to road haulier and this yeah. becomes so much easier. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, that sort of action happens now. When we have particular, you know, particular impacts, for example, when we've had issues in the Channel Tunnel, um, off some of the, you know, we have fight very hard to get freight operators to use those services. And if we lose them, if you lose, you know, if you lose uh, one intermodal, say a, a particular customer, if you lose them, they ain't coming back. They they just flip over, and that's the end of that. Particularly supermarkets that require everything to be spot on. So that's still true. It's very much true. Well, I mean, I have a sort of anecdotal personal story about that. I mean. 
Uh, I, I was grew up in a place called Cal in Wiltshire, which was the home of Harris's Bacon. So they had yeah. huge Harris's Bacon factory, and, and a lot of their stuff, excuse me, you know, was shipped out by, by rail. The branch line for Cal was built for, to carry Harris's Bacon and sausages. Now, I wasn't, I mean, I was only born in 1954, so I don't remember it, you know, personally. But apparently, as a result of the 1955 rail strike, they started shifting um, their traffic to road. And by the time I do remember, the sort of early 1960s, you know, the rail traffic um, of Harris's Bacon was really very minimal. Um, you know, it, it would all switch the road. It was more reliable. Yeah. And that's a constant theme, you know, throughout this, that the, the road is just more reliable. Um, or certainly was certainly yeah. was at the time then when the traffic wasn't quite as high and, and, and yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah when roads were a bit more empty and there was this nascent feeling that the roads were going to be continually improved there would always be an improvement that would always yeah. get that so yeah. yeah there was that sensation for for a long time um keep sending your thoughts through um matt reed yeah we'll come back to the idea of the future and what what, what can be done in the future um so so save those questions up and ask me again later on um yeah i think we'll talk about common carrier obligations shortly as well um, because that's obviously uh, critical and didn't get reversed until 62. So uh, the next slide I shall press. I, some of these are going to jump into video, which uh, I, I, I've forgotten which order, so forgive me for that. Ah, right, yes. So so that was 1954. 1955, enter the 1955 Modernization Plan, which I'm sure lots of you have heard of, um, which, well, I tell you what, so we've got two nice slides here, but uh, perhaps start off by telling us a bit, give us a bit of context about the Modernization Plan, Ian. Well, the modernisation plan was the British Transport Commission's first sort of attempt, really, to get to grips with um, the fact that the railways were losing money hand over fist. Um, and it was, well, it's stretching it actually a bit to call it a plan, really, I think. <laughs> yes, um, Beach, I do agree. Beeching had a, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, Beeching had a good quote about the modernisation plan. Um, he wasn't impressed by it. Um, and so, you know, it, it, in terms of freight, it proposed a number of things. Um, it, uh, I think the next slide, it, it was very keen on sort of marshalling yards. Yeah, um, so there we go. So, you know, it, it, it planned uh, to reduce the number of sort of small freight yards um, considerably and concentrate freight sorting in huge marshalling yards. Um, I can't remember which one. Is, is that Tinsley? Might be Tinsley near Sheffield, I think. Um, the, the one on the left is a, a, just a local goods station in Birmingham, um, I think. So rationalising um, uh, freight sorting facilities into these huge marshalling yards. And we'll come back, I think, to that later on. Um, and then the next slide, which was the other sort of major thing, was I suppose was um, getting rid of sort of the, the uh, old unfitted freight trains you see on the left there. Um, which were, you know, in, in, I think they were limited to something like 25 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, if they came to a gradient, down gradient of anything more, I think, than about one in 250, the train had to stop uh, and the guard had to get out and manually pin down the brakes. And then when they got to the bottom of the, the hill, you had to get out again and unpin them all. Um, and they were going to replace them with the sort of, you know, new modern fully fitted um, freight trains. And the picture there, which is a, a Terence Cuneo, is that how you pronounce it? Poster. Yes, where's the mouse? Is a, a, a fully fitted container freight, early container freight, which was going to run from Glasgow to London overnight called Condor. Um, the irony is that you can see there it's being hauled by um, the two of the Metropolitan Vickers Type 2, which were probably the least reliable of yeah, all. some of the worst. <laughs> of of the, the diesels introduced under the modernization plan. Um, you know, they had two-stroke engines. They were filthy. They kept breaking down. Um, you know, they were totally unsuitable and eventually they had to be all taken off. Uh, but again, you know, the, the service was incredibly unreliable because of, of that. And so, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't used really particularly. Um, yes. Particularly well, so... Yeah, so uh, yeah, a sharp. Yeah. It's an interesting contrast in this this idea of modernization. Actually, the, the, it was it was chaotic. There, there's, there's a rail natter episode in the modernization plan that I I shall right. do and pick out because it's such an interesting subject in how not to do. You know, I talk about big grand plans and how important they are. That wasn't one. It was exactly not how to do one. And we can learn a lot about our big new industry change that's about to happen from how much of a failure the modernization plan was. Um, Anyway, so uh, next slide is ah right yes yeah, so 
But right, so the next slide is, I mean, this is another film that BTF produced, which looked at how a, a particular region, in this case, the northeastern region, was was moving forward. So it sort of, again, highlights some of the sort of initiatives that were sort of being tried out um, on the ground. I think this film dates from about 1960. So it's sort of a bit later on, you know, when the modernization planners, in theory, had time to sort of uh, come to effect. And, yeah, OK, so let's, uh, let's have a watch. New needs and the greater demands in turn create new traffic and call for new and better services to cope with it. This is what British Railways modernization means. This is what it's all about. Keeping pace with developing social and industrial demands, whatever and wherever they are. Whether it's carrying a million tons of iron ore a year from Tyne Dock to Concert, or 60,000 tons of cement in press flow trains from Hull. That's the load carried in a year and it's increasing all the time. Is it now? <laughs> On Tees side, from ICI's Billingham plant, fertiliser traffic is running at the rate of over half a million tonnes a year. In fact, in the northeast as a whole, fertiliser manufacturers require as many as 200 wagons a day. The region has appointed a specialist to its sales staff, to concentrate on the development of the bulk liquid traffics, including, of course, oil. About a million tons of liquid in bulk are carried by rail each year in the region, and the volume is growing. Yes, the railwaymen of the northeastern region carry anything that pays. So there we go, that's a nice train full of tractors, actually. Um, yeah, yeah. With, so, I mean, wonderful footage uh, it's just it's it's but but the thing that immediately strikes me is how much or rather how little it looks different to what came before actually it's, it's well there, there are changes there's there's a lot of single single type bulk yeah. hole, which is which is which is change but a lot I suppose, of it, yeah i suppose the point is in a sense you know if this if this way of of, of carrying freight is going to work then you would think the northeast would be, you know, the best place for it to happen. You've got a huge concentration of heavy industries producing sort of bulk commodities, you know, that really uh, are best transported by by rail. Um, what this does, though, it, it's typical of, again of British transport films, paints a rather rosy picture because what they don't show is the huge numbers of unfitted coal trains that were still working. Um, I think that the last unfitted freight train. Uh, to run in Britain was in something like 1984 and was a coal train in the northeast. Was that still um, like old 1950s wind cutters? Yeah, 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 yeah. So alongside, you know, this sort of attempts at modernization, you know, bulk haulage and all of that, company trains almost, you know, there was a lot, the, the, the main way of carrying the, the major uh, product of the region was still little advanced on sort of, you know, what it was like in the 1900s, really. Yeah. So we've had an interesting point from David Bumstead, who's, who says, um, what effect would it have had? Actually, I'm going to adapt your question, David, because it's an interesting question. But um, I'm going to actually ask, why didn't unfitted freight get removed in the 1930s, which had been happening elsewhere uh, in, in Europe? Mm. Uh, do you think there is any particular reason, any obvious reason for that? Or do you think it was just a uh, intransigence um, or busyness of the, the big four? Uh, I think there are probably a number of reasons. I mean, one was, yes, you know, just a general sort of, not intransigent so much, but still, uh, uh, you know, a view, I think, amongst many railway managers that, you know, well, things are going fine. We don't need to change. You know, we don't need to modernise, really. Um, there was certainly a cost implication. Um, going back to the coal trade, um, the vast majority, even on nationalisation, the vast majority of coal wagons were private owned. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, they would have had to have all been completely sort of got rid of and replaced. Um, so we get so off... to an extent, perhaps laissez, a bit of the laissez-faire that we had in the UK meant that because it was all lots of individual yeah. private owners, they it would have been a, a cost they just couldn't have borne themselves to change to fit it. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah, OK. And, and as part of the modernisation plan, there was a big debate um, in the railway executive about whether to go for vacuum braking or air braking. And they started, they went for vacuum braking, I think, originally, and then had to change their mind because, of course, it just didn't work, wasn't, wasn't effective enough to, 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 for, for heavy freight trains. Mm. So they had to sort of, you know, change it all. Uh, 
and and you know that that was was a very costly exercise i think so i suspect cost was the main thing main reason <laughs> Michael C, that's not a silly question at all. That's exactly the sort of question that we, we that's worthy of asking, which is, what is unfitted freight as opposed to fitted freight? Uh, Ian, do you want to take that one, or do you want me to? Right. Okay. So, um, unfitted freight, um, the 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 locomotive does not control the brakes on the wagons. So each wagon has has brakes, but they can only be applied manually. So, as I said, what, what happened was an unfitted freight train would get to the top of a gradient and the guard would, would stop and the guard would have to get out and put the brakes on, basically, on each wagon separately. Um, because the locomotive wasn't, the, the, lo the brakes on the locomotive were not strong enough, not powerful enough to prevent the train running away, going down even a very gentle gradient. So they, they'd put the brakes on, they'd get to the bottom and they'd have to unpin them. Uh, whereas fully fitted freight, you know, is... is well, basically, all all trains now are fully fitted, whether they're uh, passenger or, or freight. You know, so the the locomotive operates the brakes. Um, uh, that's why you always had guards vans on the back of trains, freight trains, because the guard also had a brake. Um, and in the event, for example, that a coupling broke, um, mm. then it was the guard's job to put the brake on in the guards van, because otherwise the train that bit of the train would run away. Um, and it was not an uncommon going uphill. It was not uncommon for couplings to break, um, and the guard have to sort of hurriedly put on his emergency brake, which would be just about strong enough probably to sort, of, if not stop the train running away, at least sort of slow it down. Yeah, there's a reason why guards' you know, brake vans had a layer of concrete on them to add a bit of extra weight, so they could yeah, actually uh, yeah, you know, yeah. have the tractive force to 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 stop a a line of uh, wagons. And you'll uh, see some some pictures of of um, when diesels are introduced um, because diesels weren't generally as heavy as steam locomotives and i presume because they didn't have as big wheels they had to have a special brake tender um so an additional sort of uh it's like a flat wagon at the front um you see all the peaks a lot actually the peaks hmm? that used to go over the pennines you see yeah. they've got this flat thing in front of the class 40s or the, the class 4x's that's um yeah um slightly bizarre looking um uh, lots of people going why the hell did they do that Everyone, you have to remember that it took until the later, the latter part of the 1800s uh, and a horrific rail crash in Armagh before brakes were considered a necessary thing to have on trains at all. <laughs> you know, so the, the rail industry went for, I, I'm afraid, you know, laissez-faire, the rail industry went for the absolute bare minimum it possibly could for as long as it possibly could, particularly while it was a private enterprise. So, yeah, that's why you still had trains without any, uh, you know, without this, you know, yeah through fitted brakes it would it would be interesting to look at what happened in different countries but as i say another key key factor in this country certainly was that up until nationalization the majority of freight wagons i think were privately owned so you were you know, you're dealing with thousands of private owners you know um who in many cases you know would have been unable or unwilling certainly to even consider yeah Never well, mind. they'd have just, they'd have just threatened, oh, you don't want to use my wagons? Well, I'll take it to the road then, you know, so it's a bit of a <laughs> yeah, catch-22. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, we digress, but that's a very that's a good question and, and worth exploring. Mm. So I'm going to go back to our miniaturised faces. Um, let's press on to the next slide. So, um, despite all this work, we continue to have decline. So I think we, we, we hop on to the next graph, uh, Ian, and, and talk yeah. us through what we're seeing here. So so we, we, saw, we saw up to 1954, and up to that point, yeah. it had been kind of level, uh, up to there, but now we're starting to see a, a change in the orange line, which is the uh, the yeah. actual absolute amount of um, freight uh, ton miles. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the volumes are beginning to drop, and you know, obviously the the market share is is declining quite remark quite markedly, um, down to what just over twenty five percent by nineteen sixty two. Yeah, yeah. So all that, you know, all the the, the efforts of the modernisation plan really made very little difference yeah. uh, if, if any at all yeah yeah and it's interesting that you end this in 1962 because there were there were fairly major seismic changes in the industry at that point so yeah it's these yes. are interesting little tidbits so uh previously it was nationalization to pre-50 to, to, to before the um, modernization plan and then this is modernization plan to the 1962 transport act yeah um, that's right yeah. so uh yeah um and you can see for everyone who's watching, so we had 50 dropping down to 40% from, from 1948 uh, to 1954. Uh, and then now we've got 40 dropping down to 30%. Yeah. 
from so in a in a similarly kind of short half decade ish period. So that's a drop in twenty percent over a, about you know, just over a decade, a decade and a half, which is quite it's quite a remarkable reduction in mode share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, so, so enter these boys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that the, the one on the left had necessarily so much sort of to say about freight, but certainly um, the one on the right, Beeching, did. And of course, you know that. I mean, most people concentrate on what he said about passenger services, um, but in, in, he was equally radical about um, freight services. Um, and I think the thing I say about Beeching is he's one of the very few people involved with the railways over the last, well, since nationalisation, who had who, who thought about what are the railways for? Why do we have them? You know, what are they there to do? Um, and obviously, you know, you can sort of debate whether his views were right or wrong, but at least he had a plan. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he had a plan. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm firmly of the, uh, like, actually, Beeching did try and answer that question, unlike anyone else since uh, camp. Uh, I'm not, perhaps, yeah, I'm not, to, yeah, to be honest, I'm quite happy for us to entirely de vilify Beeching, because I, I don't think he has responsible for any, his responsibility for any of the negative things particularly that happened. He might well have made bad calls, but at least he tried to have a plan. He yeah. did, and as we're about to talk about, quite a few of the things he did were very revolutionary in a very positive way. Yeah. Um, yeah. We wouldn't have this thing behind me up here. The, the, it's the corporate identity manual. We wouldn't have that without beaching. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, so here we are, Marples and beaching. I've, I've started out so that the QI clacks and doesn't scream at me, uh, which it often does whenever anyone mentions beaching. So, yeah, Marples on the other side, by the way, for anyone who's not sure, who was the um, Minister for Transport at the time um, of the... Uh, of, of the appoint Basically, we went from a point where we had the, the, the British Transport Commission, the 1962 Transport Act... Um, shifted all that about and and split things off and, and we ended up rather than having a fully integrated thing with a with a kind of executive we then had the british railways board and the first chair of that was beaching i think that's right ian isn't it that's right yes yeah. so actually one thing we haven't mentioned you know was one of, going back to the british transport commission of course when it was set up in 1948 um uh it, it's of our aim was to integrate road and rail and it actually sort of you know nationalized um, a considerable portion of the road hauling industry. Yeah. Um, Wells is the, kind of the main one that, that yeah, jumps to singularly mind. Singularly failed, really, to integrate it. Um, but then I think it was it the 1953 Transport Act when the Conservatives came back to power, they they denationalised the road haulage. Yeah. Bit. Not uh, Pick Pickfords. I don't mean Pickwells. Pickwells is where you get really nice um, <laughs> or, or orchard yeah. cider <laughs> near is. Bishop's Lydiard. Can and highly recommend that. Um, so there, there was yeah. a bit that carried on British road services. I think remained nationalised. It did, and it and it's now. Well, I don't. I don't see it at all anymore. I remember seeing it a lot when I was a kid on the motorway. It, it became Lynx, Lynx right. Express, uh, right. was what BRS was. Um, I don't know if Lynx Express is anywhere anymore. Uh, I never see them out and about. Uh, so I think they've probably met a demise. Actually, they probably haven't met a demise. They'll have been asset stripped and turned into some sort of generic logistics yeah, organization yeah. in the city somewhere. Anyway, as happens with a lot of former major national entities. So here's Marples and Beeching looking very high, high resolution, which is nice. Uh, Beeching brandishing the reshaping of British Railways. Um, no. Ah, right. So, yes, we're going to now go into basically the diagnosis and the and the prognose and the yeah. you know, the prescription in the next video so perhaps we should watch these and then we'll chat about them well could i just say a little bit about them first yeah yeah go for it go for it so the first one the diagnosis is taken from um beeching's presentation of his plan as filmed by british transport films so this was a film primarily intended for railway staff but also for the general public it was shown in cinemas and then the prescription um people might sort of see it and wonder who the uh, bespectacled um person is well he's the um Noted historian Professor Jack Simmons. Ah, I'm not sure okay. will be known to many of you. Ah, there we go. So, um, right, we shall watch with interest. Now, this whole vast network, once so vital, is vital no longer. Much of the country's transport needs can be provided by other means, often more convenient, sometimes more efficient. Yet throughout the country, we are still moving tiny, separate consignments of freight, stage by stage, from one marshalling yard to the next.
individual wagons doing a slow motion stop go in ever changing combinations. Even today, railway wagons often form part of as many as six trains in the course of their journey. Think of the cost of it, and think too of the competing lorry going from door to door. Standing, standing, standing. Then a short journey and standing again. The railways of this country are, as far as freight's concerned, at one of the most critical stages in their development, and I think one of the most exciting. For they're engaged in turning themselves into a transport instrument of a new kind, suited to new conditions. The mechanization of road transport has made it quite unnecessary for them to fulfill their old function of being common carriers for all kinds of freight in consignments, large and small, to all destinations, the things that went by the old-fashioned goods train. Instead, they are freeing themselves to concentrate on the job they can really do best. That's the rapid conveyance of heavy freight in big consignments between large centers of population. No other form of transport can touch the railways at that. But if they're adapting themselves to a new world, it's fascinating to see how they're really returning to the principles on which they began. They're now concentrating on carrying what they're designed to carry. And they're doing it with trains of vehicles that remain permanently coupled together, fitted with continuous brakes, which makes it possible to drive them fast and to know at the same time that the train can be slowed down safely in a very short distance. So there we go. That's that's two very lovely excerpts of British transport films. I don't know whether we're going to get a copy. We'll see if the YouTube decides to copyright strike us. But this is fine <laughs> under fair use because we're, we're doing a documentary, everyone. But uh, lovely excerpts there. Uh, what's interesting is that in the diagnosis, the first video, it's interesting to see how many of the video of the the the, the northeastern video from earlier, how many of those images almost are repeated in the, in the diagnosis uh, footage. It's quite something. Um, yeah, it's lovely to watch those. It really is. Um, oh, by the way, everyone's saying that Lynx Express has been wound up in 2005 into UPS. There we go. Thanks thanks for the information, everyone. So, well, Ian, we've just had the, the diagnosis, the prescription. Any, anything to say about the prescription video other than what you've said already? Well, uh, it's interesting, you know, sort of what, what Jack Simmons saying. You know, this is the railways basically going back to what they were invented for, you know, carrying freight. Um, carrying you know large consignments of, of heavy goods at high speed between major population centers that's what that's what they're good at that's what they can do that nobody else can really yeah. um uh you know so it's interesting i think that he sort of makes that link back mm. you know to that very first picture of the uh from the liverpool and manchester railway yeah. i think the other thing i would say about British transport films they were professionally produced on 35 millimeter stock so they're really high quality mm. uh, and and they've been a lot of them been remastered by the british film institute so yeah, yeah. Yeah, strongly recommend that you go to the British Film Institute website, and they're 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 not cheap, but also considering the value of what's in them, they're not they're not expensive either. You can get you can get Blu-ray of all of the um of of of, of almost all of the really well-known ones, and they're continuing to 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 remaster and and release these. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so go and support the uh, the BFI. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, hello, BFI people. Don't don't copyright strike us. We love you. Um, so the other thing that, that in the prescription video, the second video there, we heard that phrase "common carriage," the common carriers. Um, do you want to talk a little, just just briefly, tell us what 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 that meant and and what happened in 1962 that changed that? Right. So basically, common carriers dates back really to the birth of the railways, where um, because of sort of concerns about possible monopolies, um, they were effectively the railways had to carry anything. Um, that they were asked to. So, you know, you could pitch up with an elephant um, at your local station and say, you know, I want this sent by rail, and, and they had to do it. Um, and I think, I can't remember the exact details now, but for a long time as well, there were limits on what they could charge. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, not only did they have to sort of carry what might be an economic load, so they were not necessarily able to charge economic prices for them either. And so one of the sort of constant um, themes, if you like, of the sort of history of freight 
up until 1962 is battles between the railway companies, the big, the, you know, the, the, the pre-grouping railway companies, the big four, and then British Transport Commission and the railway, the British Railways, railway executive rather, with governments about this common carrier obligation. Because of course road hauliers didn't have that, uh, and so road hauliers could easily undercut um, the railways either by charging less or by refusing to take you know loads which are uneconomic and yes it wasn't until the transport act of 1962 that that obligation was finally uh, finally abolished and, and in fact this was this was something that was understood as being a problem in the late eight you know after the first world war in fact grouping happened uh, the architect of, of railway grouping the creation of the big four i can't remember his name now but he had he, he had strong intentions of removing that common carriage requirement as part of that act, and it was stripped out. It was actually pulled out, and then it required a big battle. And eventually, it was protect. It was going to go through in an act in 1939, I think, possibly planned for 1940. And then this another thing happened called the Second World War, which put paid to that. And then it was just left on the back burner, and no one could agree again until until it finally got resolved in '62, as we said. So, yeah, um, a bit of a mess, really. It was, it was potentially could have solved a few of the problems of the railway a little earlier had that been resolved with with the the yeah. uh, the railways act of 23 um which uh sorry 20 yeah it was 23 actually because it was actually grouping actually happened first january 4, 24 or was it 20 or 21 and then 23 i forget it, the, the the early 20s when it all was kicking off and, and grouping happened um yeah so what next uh, I can't remember because I can't remember what the next slide is, but it's oh uh, yes, so beaching. So here's beaching. Beaching wanted innovation. So this is this is um, I think the next is the next video called Forward to First Principles. Is that what? Um... No, I think the next video is the, the the next few videos aren't there are examples. Ah, they're the innovation things. examples. So is this a quote yes. from beaching or is this a quote from Simmons? No, this is a quote from Simmons. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah Forward yeah. to first, I like that. Forward to yeah. first principles. It's a reference. So I, I see what you mean. This is referencing what what railways were good at. The first principles. Yeah. What yeah. railways were good at. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. Tell us a bit about innovation then. So um, perhaps well, we could, do you want to go through the videos or do you want to talk a little bit about innovation first? Then we can go through them one by one. Um. Well, just, you know, so going back to what I was saying at the beginning, you know, the sort of idea that, uh, that the railways, British railways, you know, were stuck in the mud, didn't, you know, didn't uh, innovate, didn't sort of um, try out new ways of delivering services um, is a bit of a myth, really. And so the next sort of four or five, I think, videos highlight sort of examples of, of innovations that British railways introduced following the reshaping plan, some of which were world leading. Um, you know, uh, hadn't been tried out anywhere else. Um, you know, so again, it's not the case that sort of the railways were, were in Britain were lagging behind what's happening in other parts of the world. There are there are some things where they were very much in the forefront. So, mm. so yeah, if, let's... if you run through them and then I can sort of talk about yeah. that. So, so let's kick off with the first the first innovation. Well, in fact, there's three on this screen. So we'll watch all three videos through, and then we can talk about the first three. One of the most significant of daily arrivals represents perhaps the ultimate in surface freight transport and sets a seal on the rightness of the original liner train concept. It is the company train moving goods from one country across the sea to another, joining industrial plants hundreds of miles apart across international frontiers. Alan Spencer, Ford Central Traffic Manager, explains the process. The job of linking two production plants is not new. Conventionally, it is done in wooden packing cases by liner or chartered shipping companies. What we have attempted to do at Ford is a very different operation, both in size and in the speed required. Forty-two 30-foot containers are loaded every day at our Halewood plant. And they arrive in Belgium the following morning. Sheet metal parts are very prone to damage and they are also very space consuming for the weight involved. This was a problem researched by our material handling engineers and they had to come up with the very best size of pallet, the very best way of stacking them so we could use the cube allotted to us the most efficient and economic way. With the container we can standardize on all our material handling methods within our plants. This makes the problem of manpower and also of speed much simpler. To ensure the best use of our huge capital outlay, 
most expensive dyes and machines are used to produce quantities for many assembly plants. The exchange of parts with Genk in Belgium, Cologne and Saar Louis in Germany not only keeps production capital outlay down, but also provides flexibility in times of peak demand. One plant can help out the other because we have an efficient system of moving parts between them. It's the front corner of a Cortina. The whole problem of reducing our production costs Possibly. is something that we are constantly tackling to ensure that we get the best possible penetration into our vital export markets. Although we want the minimum of stock lying idle, at the same time we must be sure that we safeguard our production lines against stoppage because of shortages of parts. The balance is a very fine one. What we want ideally is an extension of one production line in one country into the production line of another country. This is only possible if we can rely on a daily movement come rain or shine. This is what the freight liner was asked to provide and what in fact by working together we have achieved. Freight loads both by sea and land become more and more impressive. This is the first train of 100 ton rail tank wagons. They're the biggest in Europe and are used to transport nearly a thousand tons of fuel daily from Stanlow refinery to Tipton gas works in the Midlands. Their size means a saving of at least 10% on the annual cost per ton payload and their continued and increasing use is turning the railway into a pipeline, available wherever it is required. Nice They're successful and profitable by keeping <coughs> fully loaded wagons on the move. So what about the idea of moving an enormous train round and round in a circle? continuously from loading to unloading point and back again. The round-the-clock demand from power stations for coal from nearby collieries was an opportunity to try out the idea, and the merry-go-round came into being. Cooperation between the three nationalised industries, power, coal and rail, led to a transport system new in the world. 26-ton hopper wagons are permanently coupled into a train carrying about a thousand tons of coal each time round. As the train approaches the power station, it has waiting for it an array of devices which have taken years of research to perfect. As a safety measure, the automatic devices work only while the operator keeps his finger on the button. Signalled for the go-ahead, the train is maintained at a steady half mile an hour, automatically of course. The electronic eye counts each wagon and warns the whole system that it's approaching, ready to be unloaded. In the power station, unloading is continuous, set in motion by trackside apparatus as the wagons pass. Considering that every split second the train is getting lighter, it's a remarkable piece of equipment that keeps wagons moving so slowly and yet at an unvarying pace. As a result, the Medigo round unloads faster than any train before. Now that collieries are being specially equipped to load the new wagons, the Medigo round comes into its own. No pile-up at either end. And those, yeah, it's interesting, those Medigo round wagons, those shilled and built wagons, all of them shilled and built, um, they were such a major feature of this whole corner of the country between yourself and myself here down in York yeah. and, and quite a bit further south to boot. Um, and in fact, some of my colleagues at the Permanent Way Institution have lots of stories of these, when empty, uh, occasionally ending up li quite literally in a tree when they've accidentally derailed themselves from, from a bad running <laughs> axle box or something. Uh, they're remarkably right. lively when empty. <laughs> right. I mean, one of the problems... I mean, on the merry-go-round trains, I think the, the, the biggest problem that British Railways faced with those was getting the National Coal Board to agree to them because it meant, you know, quite a lot of investment at the pits in order to, you know, be able to unload them and sort of that. So, you know, British Railways invested, you know, in, in developing the technology and the, because one of the things is you have to be able to drive the train at a, very, at a constant, very slow speed. And, and that requires, you know, special 
um, equipment to control the locomotive. So the British Rail, as well as the new wagons, invested a lot of money in developing the concept, which is comes from the reshaping report, uh, only for the, the National Coal Board to sort of drag their feet, I think, in, yeah. in terms of introducing them. And um, going back to the company trains, I know somebody asking, is this the sort of is this talking about just in time? Well, yes, I think this must be one of the first examples of you know a just in time supply train uh, chain, um, because you know these containers were going from was it Harewood or Dagenham across to across to Brussels. Um, so you know uh, uh, the, the the production depended on a constant um, and steady stream um, and a reliable stream of uh, um, of of these containers. Um, and I don't know why. I don't think they still happen. I don't quite know why they 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 came to an end. Maybe again, it was just a question of reliability. Um, but you would have thought they should be able to uh, have, have solved that. And and the, the hundred ton oil wagon, you would think again. You know, oil would be a natural product yeah. to be transported in bulk um, by rail, particularly in these you know trains carrying a couple of thousand tons of oil, perhaps. You know, but again. Um, it, it, it's declined. There's a, 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 an oil refinery just not far away from me, Jarrow. Um, for a long time, that had no, it, it's got a rail link for a long time. There was no service. Um, uh, and it's just been restored, I think. And I think, Gareth, you're working on the doubling on you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah the that's what I was about to say. Yeah, I know, the, uh, <laughs> I know that very depot because they are planning on ramping it up quite spectacularly. At the, they, they, right. have, they have big plans for that one. So. We'll see how much those come to fruition, but yeah, part of the, the doubling work there, the, the the metro flow work to get that the last single track section of uh, Tynemuir Metro doubled properly, uh, negotiating the freight through that has been interesting, shall we say? Um, yeah. But that work is ongoing. Yeah. Um, what was it? Mex something? Oh, I can't remember exactly who who owns it now, but anyway, yeah, they are planning to, right, to, right. to to ramp that that up. So so yeah. But this is, you know, oil wagons were a common feature until uh, until the. Uh, it seems that they've dissipated quite substantially through the through yeah. the early to mid nineties. Uh, yeah. Not quite sure why. Yeah. Anyway, so that's three innovations. Let's pop on to the next three. There, there are lots of nice uh, chat coming through. Um, oh, in terms of volume, yeah. Sorry about the volume variety. There's a bit of volume variety with some of these. They're all cranked up to their maximum, but some of them are a bit quieter than others. So, um, all I can say is turn your volume up briefly. Uh, right, next, next project uh next innovation rather uh, should i say i've got i'm looking at um uh, gordon shouting about metroflow yeah uh, gordon you working on that gordon um anyway right next oh it's going in the wrong order that's something i can fix wait watch, watch this what well, on the hoof editing is uh is what it's all about wait just just while you're doing that one oh, of yeah, the, go for it one of the comments is about um a loco now and then with two oil wagons going through ely one of the ironies i think is that um oil deliveries to rail engine depots is quite often done by road now <laughs> yeah yeah it's a, a rather harsh um a rather harsh reality isn't it um right start again uh, so innovation four throughout the day trains from the sheffield freight terminal and elsewhere converge on tinsley marshalling yard the focal center of sheffield's new railway On an undeveloped site, some two miles long and three quarters of a mile wide, it has been possible to start from scratch and build the most advanced marshalling yard in the world. The shed is one of the largest in Europe. Its deck is 920 feet long and has berths for 80 delivery vehicles. A warehouse with over three acres of floor space adjoins the separate sections of the Here's shed. The trolley, Marshall, we'll see to those trolleys in the One section to handle outgoing, the other for incoming traffic. Incoming goods are given their primary sorting, governed by colour coding, onto trolleys which have replaced the hand barrows. The trolleys are then towed by battery electric tugs to the road trailers which deliver goods throughout the entire Sheffield division. I love this one, don't crush with stuff on top. That's brilliant. <laughs> Aha. Somewhat of an integrated system there. Integrated urban logistics uh, in action. 
so yeah, so we've got Which, those. So that's so. Tell us a little bit about this about this one, Ian. What uh, what what? what well, well, have to well this was this was an attempt to sort of, if you like, remodel services across the whole city. Uh, in, obviously, in this case, Sheffield um, brand. So again, historically, they they uh, inherited lots of small depots, um, small goods yards. So the idea was amalgamate all the depots into one, um, build a brand new uh, marshalling yard. Um, you know, sort of try and sort of streamline everything, um, you know, sort of uh, speed sort of throughput and everything. Um, and yes, you know, sort of provide a door-to-door service effectively, um, f- you know, for, for, for goods, particularly with, I mean, one of the sort of traditionally, one of the sort of railway's big um, markets was what they called wagon load, um, you know, which was a, a small company would have just one wagon load of goods to, to, to send or individual customers would be sending, you know, parcels, um, you know, the sort of stuff that obviously today, you know, Amazon and, you know, you see all the DHL and DPD and UPS and all those vans, you know, scurrying around delivering parcels. They were attempting really to, to I suppose, to sort of try and capture or sustain, retain that sort of market, mm. which was already beginning to sort of slip away from them. Um what happened in Sheffield, unfortunately, was, you know, the marshalling yard in particular was very dependent on the steel industry. That went into sort of steep decline in the 80s. Uh, and I think Tinsley closed 25 years or so after it opened. Uh, you know, it didn't last very long. Uh, and all those big marshalling yards have now closed. The freight depot would have probably lasted until the early 90s, I guess. Um, you know, they just couldn't. One, they lost markets through the decline of traditional customers, you know, huge customers. Uh, and secondly, they just really couldn't compete with, um, you know, as we'll see later on with, with lorries, really, yeah. with, with road traffic. You know, so, yeah. and, and to answer some of the people asking about the future, this is, a, uh, to my mind, a very good model for how urban logistics could work now. You know, you, you, we, we have a lack of the space. That, that's the challenge, is that we've closed, got rid of a lot of our marshalling yards. But in terms of urban logistics, this, you know, we have... a. a a, a blight in our cities in terms of congestion of lots of individual vans going around with a half dozen or dozen two dozen companies behind it and then all the different companies have multiple vans scurrying around with like one package in the back it's just hopeless mm-hmm. um, hopeless for congestion hopeless for the environment and and i think we're going to have to see some more controlled and organized municipal logistics happening in the next 10 to 15 years and and this is not a bad model for it in fact so that was innovation four Innovation five. What are we going to learn about in innovation five? Ah, there's a touch of royalty in innovation five. Ah, really? Interesting. Okay. Yes. Ah. And whilst this report was being compiled, the contents of these containers remained in Royal Scotland. Now the new familiar site is on its way again. On a Saturday morning in October, they reached their destination. And if those early risers who saw them drive in at Buckingham Palace asked, I wonder what on earth they put in three freight liners, they were no doubt reassured by the thought that no one who is so efficient a user of modern techniques as His Royal Highness Prince Philip would use three freight liners if two would do. <laughs> oh dear, I'm pleased to see there was a lovely... Uh... Uh, electric haul. That I mean, that's basically the mod- what we have for modern freight. You know, electric hauled freight liners, and it was, and this was in the, you know, in the, in the sixties. It's wonderful. Yeah. So freight liners probably the only thing that we're looking at that survived, really. Mm. Uh, albeit very different. I mean, the, the the main focus I think now is on sort of uh, what they call deep sea traffic, isn't it? You know, yeah, shipping yeah. containers from places like Felixstowe and Southampton. Um, to inland distribution depots, but basically the concept dates back to, uh, yeah, freight liners started in the 1960s, courtesy of Prince Philip. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Prince Philip. Yeah, it's something is interesting. I was reading actually that the, the and, and I think we'll get onto this in a, in a, in a slide coming up. Um, we've already blown our time by 10 minutes, but it's fine. We're not we're, we're not too far towards the end, folks. If you're if you're hanging on, um, we have uh, there was an expectation that all of this freight liner. Uh, all of the freight liner traffic would be domestic. They, they, they did have some international, you know, some some uh, intermodals, but they thought that would be a fringe application. And actually, as you say, that's very much become the dominant form yeah, of, of, yeah, of this. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it is interesting. So that's innovation number five. Now, what, what have we got next? Has been in wagon load traffic. Well, well, okay. So this is um, Speedlink. This was their attempt, you know, going back to the, the wagon load, to solve the wagon load problem. Um, and I think the next one is a little... Is, is this a video? No, this isn't a video, is it? It does, no. have, a, it does have a video. I just paused it. it? Um, yeah, yeah, I just paused right. it. So this this has got our our, um, our title card image with the right. with this this sort of chaotic van yeah. type arrangement showing the lorry lorry into train uh, into lorry again. Uh, it's yeah, um, it's quite uh, yeah, it's quite a clever. I, I just love that little model. It's such a clever little visualization of what's going on, even if it was essentially hopeless uh, competing with because. What the roads did was just get rid of this bit. They just went, no, we don't need that bit. Just have, yeah. just, just, <laughs> just do it once, which is the challenge you've got when you, uh, you know, when you, you're not worrying about the cost of interchange. So, um, yes. So, sorry, I shall, I shall play that. Has been in wagon load traffic, but lorry sized loads. A few years ago, rail was being written off as unable to compete with the lorry. Yet today, this type of traffic is one of the fastest growing parts of the rail freight business. The name of this quiet revolution is Speedlink. The idea behind Speedlink is simple. Wagon loads in complete trains run over a network of 11 main trunk routes linking all the major industrial areas of Britain, with feeder services covering the rest of the country. Speedlink uses the latest air-braked wagons cleared to run at up to 75 miles an hour. So, while the country is asleep, the overnight speed link trains are eating up the miles. And even on the longest trunk routes, the journey times are under 24 hours. Speed link is a here today, there tomorrow morning service. Oh, tops! Speed link depends on discipline. So we monitor every stage of each wagon's journey using a computer called tops. TOPS provides all the information needed to run the Speedlink service, the location of empty wagons and where they should be sent for loading, what's in a full wagon, where it's going and the time it leaves. TOPS even knows the position of each individual wagon in every train. Anywhere on British Rail with a TOPS terminal has access to this information. And we don't keep it to ourselves. Speedlink customers can ask the TOPS computer at any time about the progress of their consignments by phone or telex. That shows how confident British Rail is about the quality of the Speedlink service. And there you go, ending on that handshake. So uh, those of you who've been asked, asking about TOPS and whether TOPS was going to get a mention, well, indeed it did as part of the, the Speedlink innovation. Um, although TOPS was being rolled out on a wider basis. So was TOPS introduced as part of, specifically for this, or was it was it something that was happening on a broader I, I, basis I, that got tied I think in? It was, I think it was introduced particularly for this. It was an American system, wasn't it? It was developed yep. by an American railroad um, precisely to do this, to, to, to track um, to track wagons. So I think it was primarily adopted for that reason. But again, you know, a, a good example, I think, of sort of fairly leading-edge technology being used, you know, this is what, we're in the late 70s now, you know, so there weren't that many computers around, I don't yeah. suppose, at the time. Um, you know, and the idea that, you know, your, your, your customer could, you know, track where, your, where their goods were, I mean, that, you know, that's still pretty revolutionary even today, isn't it? You know? I was going to say, that's, it's, it's got to be one of the earliest forms of open data in use, yeah. right? That's uh, yeah. someone else has mentioned in the chat. Absolutely, yeah, open data in action. The railway leading the charge on open data. Uh, which I dare say it still does today, actually, much as we're always trying to improve that. Will, I see you're in the chat. Hello, Will. Um, uh, uh, a big uh, advocate for open data. So, uh, Speedlink. So the next video, I think, is uh, Don't Forget Letters and Parcels. So we will, we'll watch this and then we can talk about it. 4 p.m. Manchester. For most people, the day's work is coming to an end, but not for the postman. Their busiest time is only just starting. And among the millions of letters to be sorted, is one for Mr. Henry Somerton in Lincoln. Over at Mayfield, Mrs. Price's cleaner is taken to its train. Not only is Mayfield a station which passengers never see, the 1908 train to Cardiff is one they never find in their timetables. It's just one of hundreds of special parcels trains, which run every day and night in Britain to their own tight and private timetables. 
serving us, even while we sleep. These trains don't only carry parcels for British Rail. They also carry much of the post office parcels traffic. At Mayfield, parcels from the main post office sorting depot arrive on the platforms by automatic conveyor, already bagged and labelled. According to destination, the bags are released to the platform where rail staff load them into the waiting trains. Some two-thirds of the post office parcels travel for part of their journey by rail, and that means some 15 million bags a year. Something else that has declined drastically, which is a bit of a shame, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, num the number of British Rail Blue parcel wagons that were whizzing around until pretty recently uh, and then disappeared or almost overnight is quite something. Yes, I mean, they, they, you know, they, they were huge customers for, for the railways, you know, the majority of letters. and I should have mentioned newspapers as well, of course, you know, because, uh, you know, newspapers were being distributed from, uh, you know, London and Manchester by train until the mid 80s when when Murdoch as part of his sort of attempt to break the unions um, you know reneged on the contract um, that they had with the railways and started doing it by road um, yeah so so you know and uh, again though it was sort of in certainly in terms of Royal Mail it was apparently the unreliability of the service that persuaded Royal Mail to um, to, to switch to road um, of course you know letters used to be sorted sorted on the train, yeah, yeah. Uh, the night mail, um, travelling post offices. Um, I think uh, health and safety might have a few words to say about yeah. that sort of practice today. Um, whereas now, I think there is a limited amount of, of mail traffic, isn't it? But it's all pre-sorted. Um, yeah, the, um, the, uh, the dedicated electric multiple units that, that carry, yeah. they, they yeah. do still carry post around. I think DB Schenker yeah. still operate, or DB Cargo, sorry, operate those. Yeah. Um, so they are, you know, that they for a while they were all mothballed, and there were uh, quite a few of them sat uh, south of where you are. Actually, I remember a few of them being yeah. parked up, but they they are they do run again now. So I don't know whether there's been a bit of an uplift. Um, I mean, in my ideal world, we'd we'd consolidate all parcel traffic via all all of the stuff that Amazon, UPS, blah blah, yeah. blah DPD, all of what they do would be consolidated back into Royal yeah. Mail again. Which would be uh, under well, state ownership, oh, what, and they would oh, all travel. It would then, because of that bulk, that volume would be enormous, and it would make yeah, it would make yeah. absolute sense then to have it by rail. One of the examples that's used in this film is um, a company who need a piece of technical equipment overnight, uh, and so it's transported from London to Manchester overnight um, using the what was called the Red Star Parcel Service, which was British Rail's own parcel service, mm -hmm. and it just is carried on a normal passenger train. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and that facility has disappeared. Um, you know, you used to have a, a, a guards van, didn't you? A parcels van on the yes. passenger train, which would carry luggage, your parcels, you know, and so and would also carry luggage, you know, so you could put all your huge great suitcases in there as well, yeah. and, and bikes, you know, and bikes. Yeah, you know, one, so. one of the eternal challenges of a, of a railway that doesn't really know what it's for is that the, yeah. the train operating companies were given targets for, for, for ridership and, you know, grew ride, you know, ridership has grown, um, but it was a, it's been at the expense of the ability to carry bikes and large amounts of luggage and yeah, yeah, rapid yeah. parcels. And it's something that we're, you know, the, the rail industry is currently investigating putting parcels back into uh, fast yeah, traveling yeah. trains within the timetable. But it's tentative, you know, it, it, it's been lost and the momentum, once something has gone, the momentum to make it come back again is often uh, mm. very difficult to pick up. So uh, next, well, uh, yeah, uh, so the next video is about the, the research that actually supported this. So maybe we should watch this and then talk about it. Um, so this yeah. is. This is all, all of these innovations, all of these innovations are thanks to cutting edge research. With the merry go round, a steady, slow pace is the answer. But on a main line, the distance between loading and unloading points can be hundreds of miles. And this is where real speed is the answer. Researchers at Derby concentrate on the future. In the laboratory, the behavior of a prototype four wheeled freight wagon is reproduced exactly under constant scientific observation by running it on wheels instead of rails. Such a wagon, at speed, may lash dangerously from side to side. And if equipment is to be developed which will immediately assess and correct the lash automatically, the researchers have to measure the side-to-side -side movement with very sophisticated instruments. With their laboratory on wheels, the railway scientists are on the track of an invention which could mean the next step forward in rail transport. Look for Alan, everyone. Look for Alan. Uh, 
Alan Wickens, uh, the kind of the leader of this this fantastic research that gave us uh, the HS the, the high speed freight vehicles, which in turn gave us pacers. But don't worry about that too much. Um, the these uh, just absolutely incredible work, and the work that we just saw that video didn't just lend us the the, the, the higher speed freight vehicles that we have now, but actually every single train basically running globally owes a legacy to the work done by british rail research in developing your dampers to minimize and and, and in, in most cases eradicate hunting uh so absolutely spectacular work being done um out of derby uh here yeah i don't know if you want to uh, well what's happened to that you know what who, who does that research now uh, nobody no one does it the no university one. it was expected at post what once uh brrd was spun out all it left basically all it left what all was left was uh what became delta rail and is now something else again which was managing the iecc so that the the, the integrated signaling systems um and the rest of it just disappeared the expectation during privatization was that that work would be and in the run-up to privatization because it happened before privatization that brr um got got spun out that the universities would pick it up you know but uh that's you know there is plenty of university research but the trouble is it's because it's that distant from the industry the complaint they always have is they have no connection with industry yeah. so they find it yeah. very difficult to to know what research to do to then test you know to then actually use that research in in, in practice so it's yeah it, it just disappeared no one does it uh, and so we you know therefore we there is lots of research going on but it's 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 of a if it's, it's of a different kind um it's uh, it just has that distance, and also it, there's there's very little research done for the sake of research's sake by the industry anymore. Uh, and also for the flip side of that is that when industry does research, it's not very good at it, and it doesn't record it long term. It doesn't follow the academic process yeah. to then research record that learning. So it's a double barrel failure in that we, the industry doesn't have its own proper rigorous research process. Everything just gets forgotten. The RSSB do a bit of work, but it's trifling around the edges. Sorry, everyone at the RSSB and the research work you do, but it's not. It's not the volume that BR did, and then the acad- you know, the universities. It's too abstract. The industry doesn't pay attention. So yeah, I've gone off on one there, but uh, no, it's a very good point. Ian. It's just gone, gone. It Maybe there'll be gone. a great British Railways Research and Technical Centre. Yeah, that would require investment from central government, wouldn't it? Though. So uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, hold your breath. Yeah, exactly. So um, you know, that's that's a really nice little bit of video, and then uh, the next video is fun. Uh, which is, oh, I don't know, was there anything else you wanted to say about that video? No, 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 I, I thought it just, you know, illustrates that point that, you know, so, you know that they were he- investing heavily, I think. Absolutely, in, huge in amounts, uh, unmatched volumes of, of, of well-funded research. So the next video then shows um, that even e- kind of fairly early on, people were realising some issues. So let's uh, let's watch what video I'm talking about and why what I'm on about. <laughs> I was in the Zuma going past the coast of the <laughs> No, we're just hearing beeps galore. So we've got all these innovations. We've just seen, you know, various innovations, these fantastic innovations. Um, so you kind of you raise the point, you know, was British Rail thirty years ahead of the times? And then what happened? Did these did these succeed? Uh, tell us a bit about. So, we, so talk us through the next couple of slides, Ian. Um, well, yes. So so you know they were plugging. Well, British transport films, presumably at the behest of, of British Rail, were plugging, you know, the idea in, in the late 1970s, you know, that um, congestion, pollution, you know, were, were growing problems, uh, and the solution really was 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 rail um, and shifting sort of freight onto onto rail. Uh, the problem was, I think, you know, that they, you know, they, they were sort of crying in the wilderness at the time, weren't they? You know, they had no real support from government for that idea. Yeah. There were grants available, I think, weren't there, at sort of some points in the 80s for private companies to invest in rail links. Um, but basically, you know, sort of leading up to privatisation, um, rail was being pretty much starved of investment. 
uh, even though you know it was probably by that time one of the most efficiently run rail systems in the world. Um, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so we've got this this idea that was real, but then actually there are some challenges, and also you you've you pointed out actually here, and we'll kind of go through some of the, the, the kind of the legacy of what we've just looked at in a moment with the, with the ground. <laughs> um, but there's there's an issue here where you, where you point out that Beecham gets his numbers wrong. So talk through what this issue is. So this is from his second report, which is actually very good, by the way. People yes. often go, boo, beaching too. Um, it wasn't about more cuts. It was about, it was again, it was reinforcing the idea of a plan and a strategic plan for the railways and what they should look like. It's actually a very good report. Yeah. I would strongly recommend people so, read it. So he's trying mm. 20, to sort of predict, you know, in 20 years' time what a freight flow is going to be like. Um, and he does it sort of industry by industry, so it looks at coal, oil, steel, and so on, and just general freight. Um, and these are sort of, you know, his, well, not, I mean, the report's predictions about what the um, relative freight flows between major centres would be in 1984. Uh, and as you can see, the prediction is that actually rail will have taken back a considerable amount of traffic. Um, uh, it not only retains um, uh, all the sort of really heavy stuff, but it, it gains back through things like speed link and, and that um, quite a lot of the sort of wagon load traffic. Um, I suppose what, what, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? You know, um, who is it who said the future's, uh, the, you know, prediction's always difficult, especially when it's about the future. Yeah. Um, I think a number of things that he, he failed to take account of, some of which he, he wouldn't have been able to sort of know about, we should decline in things like, you know, the steel industry with the advent of, you know, Thatcher government, you know, and all the sort of shift away from nationalised industries. Um, but particularly, I think, the growth of the motorway network, the growth in size of lorries, that was, I think, a fairly significant feature. You know, the continual sort of increase in the maximum weight allowed on, on lorries meant that uh, they could carry more and more loads. Growth of the motorway network, um, you know, meant that journey times could be reduced. Um, changes in distribution industries, you know, the, the growth of sort of these huge warehouses dotted around the country that are a bit like sort of road marshalling yards in a way, aren't yeah. they? So, yeah. Uh, the, you know, goods going yeah, in. Yeah, they did that. essentially steal the concept. It was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but, so that sort of really, I think, undermined, um, you know, a lot of the the you know the predictions that he made it wasn't that you know i don't it wasn't i don't think they could have really done anything much more than they probably did to try and retain and grow the freight business they were just comp you know consistently outpaced uh, and outflanked by um you know revolution in in road transport you know which yeah. happened over you know 20 years probably well 30 years from the mid 50s to the mid 80s really um, for people wondering about these different lines and blobs, they all just refer to, so the da the dotted lines just refer to, a, a, I think it's a quarter of a million tonnes. Uh, yeah. No, actually an eighth of a million tonnes per year. So they refer to small yeah. flows. It's, there's, there's not any other messaging. It's just talking about flows between major centres. Thick, the thicker the line, the greater the flow. Really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So from this sort of flawed prediction, because it didn't, think about enough factor you know it just couldn't bring there, there were so many logistics changes that happened so many factors it just predicted wrong yeah. this is where we get this so I, I think ian you've got some some uh you've got yeah. some key points in history that you can guide us through so so that we're back to our graph from the start again tell us what happened yeah so you know we see here a continuing um decline in the amount of freight moved and the market share so by uh, privatization in 1977 I think the market share has fallen to less than 10 percent and that's about where it's stayed since I think isn't it um, yeah. the big change since then well, two big changes since then one has been the dramatic drop off of coal traffic um, but that's to considerable extent being replaced by um, intermodal in particular but also some aggregates I think have consistently yeah. increased um, but there are a number of things that happened. So 1986, um, British Railways withdraw, British Rail as it was by then, withdraws from Royal Mail parcels. Um, 1988 is the effective end of newspaper traffic. The News International contract had ended a few years earlier, but the other newspaper companies, publishers followed suit. 
1991 speed link is disbanded um it's just losing hand, money hand over fist 2001 red star parcels closes that was a management buyout i think and was then really hit badly by a strike in 2001 oh, interesting. and never recovered um 2004 is when royal mail suspends mail trains um although they sort of do come back on a reduced basis a few years later. So over that period of the sort of mid 80s to the mid 90s, uh, 2000s, you know, a number of sort of significant services and, and businesses just withdraw or are disbanded um, because they just can't make money. They can't. They can't compete. It, it's interesting. It looks like, and this is similar. It looks like by the mid 80s, there's there's a, there's a, an uptick. So almost like perhaps some yeah. of the things start embedding and succeeding. But then, as you say, several of these external factors come in, uh, you know, the loss of newspapers, the parcel, and then it and then it just it's just off again. It just drops away. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? It's all be interesting to I mean, it'd be very difficult to understand whether had Murdoch not made that call, you might have seen a steadying of that decline, uh, even even perhaps just for a little longer. But it's difficult. There are so many factors at play, you know, so many things going on in this in this period, so many changes. um changes in the in the way that uh, in the way that the the britain's economy works you know radical yeah. changes from yeah. the from the mid 80s until the mid 90s fundamental seismic shifts in the way that britain's economy works uh, it's difficult to imagine that we'd have seen much and, of a difference by this point in history and, and in a way that shouldn't be surprising you know if you go back to that you know idea of forward to first principles you know what are the railways good at the railways are best at moving you know heavy goods in large quantities um between large population centers well once you've got rid of your steel industry and your coal industry and shipbuilding you know and a lot of those well that that market just disappears doesn't yeah. it yeah um and you know i think there's there's a sort of argument isn't there that going back to the idea of you know the sort of urban distribution that Really, you need distances of at least 150 miles um, for to make transport by rail economic as the system works at the moment, which is why, you know, someone like America or Europe, it can work pretty well. But Britain is, you know, that much smaller. So I think if we are going to see a shift, um, I think it would have to be one that's engineered. It's not going to happen yeah. through market forces. It has to be, you know, basically these things have to be priced off the road, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. See also the road pricing episode, everyone, uh, yeah. <laughs> where uh, freight being made to pay its way might uh, swing the favour. And the other thing, of course, is if it is the cost, you know, the, the major savings for road haulage is in the lack of need to interchange. So if you start introducing ultra low emission zones at all major urban centres, so that the lorries would have yeah. to interchange, so that you've got, so you end up having an electric vehicle to the outskirts in every major town. At that point, you start the, the logistics companies might start going. Well, if I'm shifting it into a lorry, maybe I might as well shift it into a train. Yeah, yeah and yeah. that changes. And the railway need, industry needs to be ready to pick that up and, and grab that opportunity. So there are seismic changes, but they would have to be as a result of radical, fundamental yeah. shifts to government policy. You know, ultra low emission zones being introduced at lots and lots of major centres, not just you know a little bit of Birmingham and, and a little bit of, of, you know, a larger bit of London and, you know, a tiny bit of Bath and Durham. You know, it needs to be yeah. every yeah. major centre has a, 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 you know, no petrol or diesel engines within the centre type thing. Um, anyway, so uh, this like? question ca then comes up. The question then comes up, well, whose fault is all this? Uh, and I think we people should already know the answer to this, really, which is uh, yeah. well, nobody's mostly. But so was it was it this guy? Uh, no. No. Uh, it was not beaching with his with his tash, was it? <laughs> this tickles me every time I see it. Was it this guy? Uh, no, it wasn't even this guy. It wasn't even him. Um, was the real villain? Uh, was it? Was it this guy driving the driving the truck? Well, it's probably a bit unfair, isn't it? Yeah, to blame him. You know, he was just trying to do a job. He's just doing a job, making a living. But uh, exactly. Yeah, but yeah. but but really, it's just the broader socioeconomics, the broader changing in industrial patterns, working patterns that 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 that. And and indeed, here's here is a here's the rank organisation presenting look at life. And and so let's 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 watch this uh, and and see what 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 we see from this. Very shiny motorway. B 
Britain you can go is the old road steam train revolution. Along a long Britain. drive in which yeah. planners' dreams turn into concrete on such spectacular new routes as this M6 motorway viaduct spanning road, river, rail and canal at Gathurst in Lancashire. Yeah, I was going to say they they very tactically placed you know, look, look down on the brown looking railway as they as as the motorway crosses yeah. over it. So tell yeah. us, so so here we go. We've got this here. Tell us a bit about what what we've just seen. Ian. Well, it's this sort of vision, isn't it? You know, sort of the nineteen sixties. You know, motorways are the future, and you get all these films of sort of you know new motorways opening. You know, empty. There's no traffic on them. There's no congestion. Um, you know, and the picture on the on the left there. You know, this is an early. Um, road haulage company, you know, so you've sort of got the beginnings here of, you know, a lot of small companies starting up, um, offering sort of, you know, door-to-door -door services uh, on a very local basis, but then sort of with the motorway network sort of growing, um, you know, and their ability to sort of carry heavier and more and more goods over longer and longer distances at speeds which competed with the railways, you know. So the railways might have sort of in the past played an advantage of, you know, well, we can get it there overnight, but, you know, the lorries can, can equally well do that once the sort of road network uh, improves. There was something like, I think Marple's made a, I and mean, we say Marple's isn't to blame, a motor program, building program, started under one of his predecessors, but he committed to building a thousand miles of motorway in the 1960s. And I think that target was actually met. Mm, yeah. uh, you know, there was huge sort of investment, uh, in, in a way equivalent to, you know, the, the investment in the railways in the 19th century. There was huge investment in, in building, expanding the motorway network um, at that time, you know, so. Yeah, in, enormous. And, it, and it's funny that, you know, there, uh, 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 there are other factors to play. You, can't, you can understand why, you know, even the unions were pro road building. You know, it was not, you know, the unions were broadly all for this. They were all, all for it. And the, the, as we said in the beaching episode, this was this was the way it felt. It was felt by most of society that this was the way the wind was blowing. You know, you, yeah. this was yeah. this is this this is a great picture because it shows what a lot of early logistics companies look like. Is this this kind of ramshackle collection of vans that they've collected from goodness knows where, um, and 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 fairly rapidly, you know, they they were having the they were essentially having the road. You know, the 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 path was being carpeted before them as government policy, both in terms of physical infrastructure and. In terms of what was allowable, the regulation of, of, of road vehicles, there, there was a huge reticence to regulate the, the road haulage industry, which lasted for a very long time. You know, there was a lot of pushback to the idea of, of introducing yeah. tachographs to, to, to you know, record how many hours drivers were, were putting in. Yeah, so so this was this was the theme of the twentieth century, and you can understand why because it meant that supermarkets, uh, you know, goods became cheaper. People, you know. People who are less well off could afford more to put more food on the table. There was, you know, th these these are these changes resulted in Britain being better off. Um, and yes, you could argue, well, if we'd thought more ahead and and shaped it more to be the railways, then might we might have been even better off still. But again, that wasn't what was being seen at the time. So I think you know, it was somewhat of an inevitability until we started getting an understanding of the problems, which was happening towards the you know through the eighties. I would say there was an understanding of. Actually, these winds of change might might have a bit of a bad smell. Um, so yeah, let's go to let's let's talk. So it's worth saying, yeah, that all was not lost. <laughs> so, um, firstly, you you alluded to this earlier. We so we've got bulk coal here, this black line at the bottom, uh, and and you can see here this is from 1980, and you can see it's sort of pretty steady, and indeed climbs through the early 2000s before then dropping off dramatically. Um, from about 2013, 2014 onwards. Whereas we've basically got this steady, uh, and the drop here is from the early 90s recession, by the way. This is this is basically what's accounting for this overall drop in, in general goods movement because people are buying less stuff. But you can see from the, in the rec following the recovery from the early 90s recession, there's just a steady climb of everything else freight-wise. Which I think backs up what you were saying earlier, Ian. Yeah, but basically. So, I mean, you know, there's a few things in there, as I say, is intermodal. Um, biomass is, is replacing some coal uh, movements in some places um, and as we'll see uh, in, in the final video um, there's some traffic that has just sort of continued really um, throughout pretty much sort of unchanged yeah, yeah. Uh, and indeed let's watch that video now uh... In 10 years, the annual volume of aggregates moved by rail has grown from 2 to 10 million tonnes. This volume could double in the next 10 years. 
Soon we shall have trains hauling up to 3,000 tons per journey. British Rail's objective is to run a competitive, efficient and profitable freight service at firm prices on an extended contractual agreement. This provides a basis of confidence for the industry's heavy investment. Once the aggregate carrying company train leaves the quarry and joins the main line, it fits into an ordinary timetable just like the crack into city expresses. By providing this service, rail freight and their customers are profiting by that increasingly rare commodity, value for money. It's interesting, isn't it? There's, there's almost like a, a melancholic knowing optimism in that one, isn't there? With the soundtrack and the, and the way yeah. it's scripted. Yeah. Um, I mean, in every single video, they talk about statistics about increasing and the, the freight is increasing. And uh, yeah, it's a clever they, spin. But um, to be fair have... to these, they, they were at Foster Yeoman, you know, was a yeah. success story and continues to you know the, the 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 movement of stone freight is a success story in the railway still yeah british transport films generally had a sort of you know viewed the world of the railways through rather rose tinted glasses they, they never sort of talked them down you know well that was it wasn't a job was it but, um yeah you know so some lovely helicopter shots there i mean to sort of if you like wind up on that there sort of, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is yeah. lovely. It is lovely. So I mean, we could talk about we could talk about stone traffic for an entire episode and what what Yeoman ended up doing in terms of train procurement and changing the way that ultimately giving us our um, our sheds that we have now. But it, but we shall not because it's uh, twenty forty three already and we've been going for um, one hour forty two. I know, right? It, time flies on these. I always forget how quickly the uh, the time goes by. Anyway, as I say, go on to the British. Uh, Film Institute website and order some of these on Blu-ray because they're wonderful, absolutely wonderful. They, they generally come as a collection, so they're, they're about you know five ten minutes. Some of these, some of them are a bit longer, but they cluster them up into one. Um, so yeah, well worth getting hold of some of those. Right. Oh, there's one there although it's being disappeared by Skype. Weirdly, uh, <laughs> it was there briefly. People, saw, I think, saw that momentarily. Um, so. All for me now is to, before we uh, say a proper goodbye to Ian, is to just do the outro, which is uh, thanks to everyone listening in audio-only form. I hope that worked. Um, uh, yes, all, available on all good podcasting platforms. And if uh, if I, my arrows work. Uh, as ever, support this to happen more via Patreon, patreon.com slash Uh Go and continue this chat on uh, Discord, garethdennis.co.uk slash Discord, and throw pennies at me if you wish via PayPal, paypal.me slash garethdennis. Do all of those things. Um I was in a podcast today, uh, or that I've recorded ages ago, um, that's uh, the Siemens Mobility Moving Beyond podcast, which is, is quite good, actually. I'd recommend going and listening to it. Uh, I, uh, I asked Mark Wilder a question. Actually, it, my question was tamed down a bit because I was being critical of the long delays of Crossrail and saying it's how much do skills play a part in this, and they've gently toned down my question into what are the skill sets needed for projects like Crossrail now into the future, and how does uh, diversity and inclusion play a role in this? And yeah, it's worth having a listen to uh, Mark Wilde's answer. The CEO asks, uh, answers my question. So go and listen to that. Um, there's uh, On Friday, we'll be back in our bizarre world of uh, railways and learning about railway history uh, through the medium of um, a weird collection of islands. So that, that'll be back on Friday after a two-week pause. And then next week, most importantly for everyone, next week we will be going through the UK's transport decarbonisation plan and seeing if it is indeed a plan. We, we talked about modernisation plan and how it wasn't much of one. Uh, let's see if the transport decarbonisation plan is, is a plan or is just says the word plan on the front. Uh, that's next week. Uh, do tune in. So really it only remains for me to, to bring, bring Ian back and, and say, Ian, that's been absolutely fantastic. Really lovely. Lovely little clips uh, there that hopefully won't get us binned and copyright struck. I don't think so. Come on. I don't think so. Nice. Uh, we'll see. Um, no, I enjoyed it. It's good. Yeah. Really, really fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, lots of people. Uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks to everyone in the chat as well for following along and asking lots of good questions. Uh, we'll talk about the future rail freight in, a, in another episode. So it's, save up your questions for that. Um, and we might talk about it next week indeed. We'll talk about decarbonisation. Ian, 
thanks thanks for your insights absolutely fantastic uh you can, ian is there anything you want to plug anything that you that uh can people read any in fact there are i think there is a letter of yours from the, in the times that people can read on the internet that's what, one of the things I, I stumbled upon strangely when i was but uh not from me no so there is another ian kit of, 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 who is so there we are i know how, how there is, I, I, um i did have an article in the last but one issue of backtrack about bridge transport films um so uh people can always look at that and i think my dissertation might even be available online yeah, oh that'd be good yeah if that's if people can look that up maybe, maybe david can sort of plug that yeah you, yeah i'll, I'll plug, plug uh, david and find a link and then i can shove it in the description if i find one um, might, might, be a, might be a plug for the course might not you never know that's it well, it's always a plug for the course everyone should go and join uh david's course it's always uh very good and very insightful and and you can see the caliber of people who end up on there so uh, well worthy of having a look into if you if that's the sort of thing that you fancy ian it only really remains for, for both of us really but uh th thanks for me and all i really have to say is um thank you for having me no it's it's a pleasure uh, and uh and cheerio everyone cheerio, Bye. cheerio. Bye.